thank Don for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, so what I want to do is just talk, just shuck a little bit. I wrote a speech, but uh, I get loosened up here just uh, talking a little bit. Because Don mentioned a couple of things, and I'd kind of forgotten about those things. I was made an honorary life member of the NAACP by Benjamin Hooks. Uh, and I don't know if they'd let me in the room now. Uh, and I was going to talk about that, too. Andy Young was Dr. Martin Luther King's right-hand man. He was uh, with him throughout the Civil Rights Movement. He was with him in Memphis when he was shot dead. And Andy uh, served terms in Congress. He was the United Nations ambassador under Jimmy Carter. And he was twice mayor of Atlanta and brought the International Olympics to that southern city. And uh, Andy, he is a Christian minister, and so was Dr. King, and they thought like Christians. Uh, Dr. King, as he marched along one day, a lot of people came out from some shanty houses, really, with rebel flags yelling at the marchers, and the kids were saying, here come those flags again, and Dr. King said, no, no, stop, you don't understand. Those folks are just like us. And he was that kind of Christian. And when he said, I have a dream that someday on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will dine together at the table of brotherhood, Dr. King didn't put any qualifications on that. He didn't say, if you take down those flags or if you tear down that monument or if you will turn your back on your ancestors. And it's what Andy was saying in Atlanta at Morehouse College that day, that the whole point of that was for us as Southerners to embrace our common heritage and our common culture and move on understanding the past and dealing with it honestly as brothers and sisters and moving into a future together. And what, thank you. And that is what we were doing. That is what we were doing. What Andy had actually said is when the civil rights movement was based in the South, we didn't care about Confederate flags or, or monuments. We didn't have time for that. We had, a, we had a country to build together. And I had enormous respect for Andrew Young. For one thing, that's the kind of courage that he showed throughout the civil rights movement. I was not a leader in the Civil Rights Movement when I was a kid. Like, uh, in fact, uh, Clyde Wilson there and I were at Chapel Hill at the same time. And I think we were both, uh, I told him I, I was drinking liquor and chasing slow-legged women, and he said, I think I did a bit of that too. <laughs> well, I'm sure we passed in the night many times, like ships in the night. But, um, it started out, all that civil rights stuff started out for me, actually, where I grew up. I, I grew up on the railroad, on the, and the first time I came to Charleston was on the old Atlantic Coastline Railroad working on a work train in the summer of 1962. You should have seen me. I mean, I was lean and mean and green and <laughs> not headed, and full of dreams. And I, uh, oh, by the way, people around Charleston know what a cooter is. <laughs> you know, they do, and, and this is where I first heard that kind of language when, when, through the Gullah and the Gullah dialect and the, and the Geechee language. Uh, a cooter is a turtle, and you can find it on, in restaurant menus around here. Just like a lot of those words came into uh, English through the Gullah Patois on the islands out there, beautiful language. Goober is another one. That's an African, West African word for be not, of course. But I figure everything I say, y'all already know, because we're all Southerners, we know all this stuff. I mean, we're talking the same language, which is kind of why it's fun to be here. You can hear it in the room, the Southern talk, you know. I've traveled all over, but you come in, uh, come into the South, and a bunch of people get together, and you can hear the laughter half a mile away. Amen, brother. But, uh, 
I grew up, I was born in a section house in Tarboro, North Carolina, right on the tracks near Tarboro. But I was deported from North Carolina when I was three weeks old because my daddy got a job as a section foreman in Portsmouth, Virginia, right on the docks. And this is right before Pearl Harbor, so I got the setting for this. Where we were on the docks, the biggest ships in the world were going by. My first memories are of World War II. I remember the blackouts. I remember uh, the Navy blimps overhead searching for German U-boats off the coast, and battleships and troop trains. And, well, uh, you know, I was going to, let me tell you this first. But anyhow, I, where I grew up was on the other side of the tracks. These section houses, they didn't have what they now call amenities. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, electricity or insulation or indoor plumbing. But this was in tide water, so the tide would come in in the old double-seater, and then the tide would go out. And, and it's kind of rough on January mornings, but... <laughs> It's good for it, good for, you know, Bill's, Bill's character. Bill's character growing out of this section. So we're there in a uh, freight yard and uh, right next to it. And our side of the tracks is called Sugar Hill. And we were the only quote unquote white folks over there. Everybody was an African American community. So for the first 19 years of my life, I was immersed in the rich African American culture. And I think that informed me in so many ways. I just feel blessed by that experience. I'd walk across the tracks and go to the white school. And I always thought about that. And when I'd be going back across the tracks, uh, you know, I'd hear, uh, Ben is a nigger, Ben is a nigger. And I went, Mama, what are they talking about? And she said, don't ever use that word. That's what stupid people call colored people. I got all that figured out. Now we're talking 1946, 1947, so. But that was a time of Jim Crow and strict segregation. I think we all have to be dead honest about that. It was awful. It was an awful way to treat people. I understand it I now as I've learned the history. I mean, when the, when the war ended, the South was just totally devastated. Nobody of any color had a pot to, to use. <laughs> no. Nothing. There was, there was no Marshall Plan for the South. <laughs> no GI Bill or any of that stuff. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, there was a punitive effort that was aimed at the South and everyone suffered from it, and black and white. And I think that bitterness sustained as whites recaptured uh, leadership and business started back and everything, everybody, you know, that's when Jim Crow came around. And it sustained, and I think that, I think, well, Harry Truman probably had to do something with that when he integrated the army, and that was a big thing after uh, you know, World War II, when blacks had served in World War I and II and in all those wars. Um, and then, so the times were changing as I was changing and growing up into adolescence and, and going to high school and all of that, Brown versus Board of Education, and uh, with very strict segregated uh, high schools and all of that, and the bus system, you get on the bus and the black folks had to go to the back, and that just seemed bizarre because the black people get on and, and they'd walk to the back and sit behind us, but we're sitting next to each other Right? And we know each other, and we work together, and uh, but anyhow, so all well, that's where we were. So my conscience was getting to me, and I'm starting to think. And when I got to, uh, I worked a lot and saved some money. I had some great jobs, sticking sticks and popsicles. I worked in a basket. Somebody's got to do that, you know. So <laughs> I worked on the railroad. I did all kinds of jobs. I made Halloween masks, and I drove a truck, and I saved up some money. And I went down to East Carolina College in Greenville, North Carolina, uh, which is now a huge university, but this was in 1960. And uh, it was the fall of 1960, beautiful, it's a tobacco town. The whole town was just filled, not anymore, but every, every empty house there, every shack was filled with tobacco and you could smell that town 15, that bright leaf tobacco, beautiful, wonderful smell. And uh, 
but it was the 1960 presidential campaign. And over at the little stadium, here comes John F. Kennedy running for president of the United States in the fall of 1960. And uh, so I was going over to cover it as a writer for the, local, for the student newspaper. And uh, so I'm sitting out there and the band is playing, happy days are here again, da, 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 da. And they play and everybody's waiting for President, uh, for President, you know, for Senator Kennedy to come and everybody get tired. There's all these old boys from, old farmers from Eastern North Carolina, yellow dog Democrats, always had been a, yahoo! <laughs> happy days are here again. I played about 10 times. And what it was is he'd stopped at the tobacco markets which were, you know, and watch those auctions and so wonderful. But anyway, he finally shows up and I, 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 comes in a limousine and he was like, they're actors like, Richard Burton was like that in Hamlet. You walk out and boom, that's what people look at. He just had that. And so here comes this guy, great handsome guy, and he gets up and he says, I'm proud to be here in, this, in the Tar Heels state. You Tar Heels, it was said that you were first at Bethel. Farthest at Gettysburg, and last at Appomattox. And those old boys, yahoo! <laughs> he won North Carolina, and that won him the presidency. The, that and Mayor Daly's help in Chicago, I think. <laughs> Luther Hodges was then the governor of, uh, of North Carolina, and these were old yellow dog Democrats. But I was inspired by Jack Kennedy. And uh, when he was assassinated, I said, it's time for me to put my shoulder to the wheel doing something. So I got involved in the civil rights movement there and was arrested a few times. Got in a few uh, serious hassles with the Ku Klux Klan. Got sucker punched, knocked out a tooth, got shot at a couple of times, and uh, got, well, uh, thrown in jail a few times too. For, but you know, in the end, in the end, America changed. It was a revolution. A revolution, a nonviolent revolution. And that was the genius of that, uh, that Dr. King and Andy Young and those other people had. Nonviolence. The nation saw that. And uh, within a few years, within a few years, uh, that whole society that I'd known had changed. And people, but in the South, and this is something you don't hear much about, integration worked in the South because we all knew each other already. We worked together for years, saw each other in the grocery stores and, you know, how's your mom and all that stuff. We were Southerners. We talked the same language. We did the same kind of work. We played, you know, we traded music. We learned music from each other. We, we shared the same weather, the same soil, the same language, the same food. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> we're Southerners. And there's something to that. I don't find it, you know, I, I love people all over the country, but I don't find this kind of pride, this cultural thing, this mystique that we have, that's a bit, it's ineffable. So I can't explain it because that's what ineffable means. We don't quite understand what it is. <laughs> but there is that mystique and it, and it, and it, brings, us, it brings us together. I ought to read the, the speech I wrote here. First of all, let me say this. Have no worries. A lot of people saying there, I know, they're, I watch it every day too, like we all do. They're tearing our culture, trying to tear our culture apart. And they're tearing down flags and they're, they're uh, statues and everything. The one in Durham just outraged me. I, I, I knew that statue. And here were a bunch of stupid, radical, left-wing nuts not even uh, uh, thinking the worst, the, in the worst sense, of the, had nothing to do with the free expression of American people or anything like that, but they tore this thing down and spit on it. This wasn't some general or some politician. This was a common soldier. And well, like I, we had in our family. And that, to me, it hardens us. It makes us mad. And we have to remember that... Uh, to control our anger. Yes. We have to be nonviolent. Yes. There are, according to the, there are no friends of ours, but the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a racket, <laughs> it's 
got $300 million they're sitting on or something like that. And it's a racket. So they're, they're out there going out to find bigots. So if that's your business, you can find some bigots and you can start creating bigots. But they searched all over the country and they came up with about 30,000 bigots, they say, here, most of them from up north, you know, Indiana, New Hampshire, Ohio. So there's 30, 35,000 bigots, racist, members of group, hate groups. You go, wait a minute, there's 330 million people in the country and you've got, you come up with 35, they spent all that money, come up 35,000. Well, let me say one thing. There are 75 to 80 million descendants of the Confederate Army in the United States of America. That's one out of four, y'all. That's all we know. So over here, what? You've got 75 million. Over here, you've got 20,000. So the media judges us by the 20,000, you know, hateful nuts. It's, a, it's, it's all set up. I wanted to read y'all something. Let's laugh a little bit. Politics, you know, is, uh, has certain skills, uh, cliches and codes and things. But people, uh, I used to hear this in Washington, say, well, I, well, where do you stand on this? And somebody would say, well, I can argue it flat or argue it round. And I go, what the hell, what? <laughs> so I want to read you a classic example of this from Judge Soggy Sweat. This is a real guy, Noah Sweat, Mississippi during a debate on whether Mississippi was going to go wet or dry. Judge, Judge Sweat said, My friends, I had not intended to discuss this controversial subject at this particular time. However, I want you to know that I do not shun controversy. On the contrary, I will take a stand on any issue at any time, regardless of how fraught with controversy it may be. You've asked me how I feel about whiskey. All right here is how I feel about whiskey. If, when you say whiskey, you mean the devil's brew, the poison scourge, the bloody monster that defiles innocence, dethrones reason, destroys the home, creates misery and poverty, yea, literally takes the bread from the mouths of little children. If you mean the evil drink that topples the Christian man and woman from the pinnacle of righteous, gracious living into the bottomless pit of degradation and despair and shame and helplessness and hopelessness, then certainly I am against it. But, <laughs> if when you say whiskey, you mean the oil of conversation, the <laughs> philosophic wine, the ale that is consumed when good fellows get together, that puts a song in their hearts and laughter on their lips and the warm glow of contentment in their eyes. If you mean Christmas cheer, if you mean the stimulating drink that puts the spring in the old gentleman's step on a frosty, crispy morning. If you mean the drink which enables a man to magnify his joy and his happiness and to forget, if only for a little while, life's great tragedies and heartaches and sorrows, if you mean that drink, the sale of which is, pours into our treasuries untold millions of dollars, which are used to provide for tender care for our little crippled children, <laughs> our blind, our deaf, our dumb, our pitiful, aged and infirm, to build highways and hospitals and schools, then certainly I'm for it. <laughs> this is my stand. I will not retreat from it. I will not compromise. That job I had on the railroad was the best job a fellow could have had. Two, for two summers, I, as I say, I grew up on the railroad. All my people that didn't farm, grow tobacco and sweet potatoes and things, they all worked on the railroad for generations. My daddy went to work for his daddy when he was 13 years old, driving spikes, laying rail, and drinking cheap whiskey. Back when whiskey was really, really cheap. He never quit that. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, I got a job on a, on a work train in the summers, and the job was covered the entire southeast United States. And it started in, in uh, Alexander Yards, and, and Potomac Yards in Alexander, Virginia, and the old RF&P Railroad went right straight down, took the coastline all over, went all the way down to Florida East Coast, did that, Florida West Coast, went into Alabama and Mississippi, and 
all over Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina, just traveled and traveled and traveled. And I did that for two summers. And I got to know the South real well. First time I encountered kudzu, you know, a particularly southern kind of thing, you know. In fact, I wrote a screenplay one time about the last kudzu salesman. There was such a man. There was such a guy. I wrote a book, The Miracle Vine, Channing Cove from, from Georgia, from Conyers, Georgia. He worked for the Atlanta Journal as an agriculture editor. He spread the gospel of kudzu. Now, my story is how 30, 40 years later, everybody's house has grown over and you can't find your car out in the yard because it's covered with kudzu. But anyhow, we're working on the railroad and we were in North Carolina. It was a hot summer day and we pulled off on a sidetrack to wait for the local to come through. We were a work train, so they had a schedule to keep. And so we, it, was, it was 102 degrees and it's humid, eastern North Carolina down there. And, we park, there's a pigsty right next to where we pulled over on the siding there. And this old brakeman's sitting there looking at me and says, gets in your eyes, don't it? <laughs> I said, so everything's brown there. I mean, every house is covered with kudzu. Everything's covered with kudzu. I said, what are you, because when we're working on re weed eradication, I said, how do y'all get rid of that stuff? He said, well, <clears throat> best thing to do it's just move away and leave it. <laughs> you know? Sometimes good marital advice there too, John. <laughs> Anyhow, so there's me. Uh, think about where American music comes from. How about that? Uh, what, there's only, the, the, the only music that I know of that's American music that did not come out of the South was the polka and klezmer. Other than that, think about it. The blues, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, jazz, bluegrass, gospel music, country music, Texas swing, it, you know, it, all Southern. So it's a very musical place and we had these great artists Rockabilly out of Memphis, I forgot that. Oh, wasn't that something? Louis Armstrong's theme song. I mean, Pops, my hero. Oh, the pale moon shining on the fields below. Folks are crooning soft and low. You needn't tell me, boys, because I know. It's sleepy time down south. Uh, he was the greatest, the south's greatest export, and there have been a lot of great ones. But how about Hank Williams, Alabama? Now this is just a, a I mean, this is a country boy here, yet he's a poet. And here's some kind of a lovesick cry he had to all those Lost yesterdays. <clears throat> the silence of a falling star lights up a purple sky. And as I wonder where you are, I'm so lonesome I could cry. Yeah. Ah, Savannah, Georgia, Johnny Mercer. How about, this is an evocation of a Dixie morning. zippity do da zippity a My, oh, my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine heading my way. zippity do da zippity a We could call Mr. Bluebird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where you see, we're not supposed to sing it. We're not supposed to. Well, who decides this? Whoever decides it, they can go to hell. You don't like Johnny Mercer. You don't like Johnny Mercer. There's something wrong with you. Zippity doo dah. What? They're the great. What? How could you? What's wrong with those people? Yankees. That's what's wrong. With them. Uh, my father said. He said, you know. I was 26 years old before I knew that damn and Yankee were two separate words. 
Uh, apologies to all of us, our friends here from north of the border. Yeah, I learned, what was, what was that? Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, this is how I learned geography. For, I, you know, there's this freight yard here, and I just walk up. It's about a mile up to the store through Sugar Hill. I learned geography from the names on the boxcars. New York Central, Chesapeake, Ohio, Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe, Florida East Coast. Pittsburgh and Lake Erie, Illinois Central, the Wabash Line, the Louisville and Nashville, and all those places out there down the tracks just waiting for me to get there. Uh, the other night, I, if y'all weren't here, I did sing a little bit of the Wabash Cannonball, uh, for, <laughs> as done by Dizzy Dean. What, did y'all hear me? Who didn't hear that the other night? Oh, well, it was about Dizzy Dean, and the thing of it was is that uh, it had to do with uh, how uh, he was uh, a poor cotton picker. He really was, and, and, and uh, didn't have much. And, so he joined the army when he was 16, he said, because he wanted a pair of shoes. I mean, they never had shoes. They were just really poor migrant farmers in the Depression. And uh, he, he turned that knack, that gift of gab he had into a great career as a, he was the first nationally televised baseball games, Dizzy Dean and Pee Wee Reese were the commentators. And Dizzy, was a great garrulous storyteller, and when the game got boring, they were changing pitchers or something, or if it was you know nine to two and nobody much cared, there's 400 people left in the stands. He would suddenly you would hear from the great Atlantic Ocean to the wide Pacific shore to the queen of flowing mountains, South Bill by the shore. She's mighty tall and handsome, and known quite well by all. She's the combination on the Wabash Cannonball. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I learned geography that way, but I also learned history right there because where I grew up in Portsmouth, Virginia, Norfolk, Portsmouth, all that, very close to uh, Jamestown, where the English experience started, and Williamsburg right there, and Yorktown. And just, we could see it, I actually could see it from the little school I went to, was a spot out in Hampton Roads there where the CSS Virginia had it out with an ironclad Union monitor. All that was there. Uh, now, here's, I'd said some of this before, but this, now we get to the serious part here. Uh, a few, uh, now, as I said here, my, uh, that neighborhood and that culture, the society was segregated, but the culture was not segregated. That's something that, that people who are non-Southern don't really understand, that these are lifelong friendships and families and things that go way, way back and that we're still sorting all this stuff out the best we can. But uh, the culture was anything but segregated. The common bonds of Southerners were shared through sights and sounds, through work and weather, through nature and music and language, and the shared experiences of life its own self. The races had far, far more in common than that which separated us. And it is my opinion that when integration finally came, it came much easier among Southerners who had always known each other and had shared our Southerness through the best and worst of times. Um, I remember a Chapel Hill in a march down Franklin Street, the College Cafe, you might remember College Cafe, Clyde, and we marched by there and in the window was a white guy with an apron and a black guy who worked for him. And it has a sign in front of them that says, white only. And we all went by there. And the next day, that sign was gone. And I found out what happened. Let's say the guy's name was Joe. Well, the guy that worked for him, Jim, when the, when the, when the march went by, took off his apron and said, Joe, I can't do this anymore. 
Hey, he worked there for 25, 30 years. He said, what are you talking about? He said, that, that's my babies out there. I go to church with those people. I can't, I can't work here. And he uh, starts to give him his aprons, heading out the door. And Joe said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Goes over and takes that white only thing, tears it in half, and throws it in the trash can. That's the way it works. <laughs> you know, it's about, anyhow. You know, we built some bridges. We did, we built bridges. And we were proud of them. And, and Atlanta's a perfect example of that. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a sleepy place. I mean, actually, I don't know if y'all know, uh, I, I can't think of my friend's name now, but he said, uh, Atlanta is what a quarter of a million Southern soldiers died to prevent. <laughs> I mean, that big, big mess. But uh, I saw, I went down there in 69, I got a job as an actor the first day I was there, a union gig too, you know, I just walked in and uh, the guy was looking for somebody to play the giant and Jack and the Beanstalk. I said, I got this, I got this big guy and everything. I walked in and said, audition, I said, Three, five, four, five. He said, you got the part. And I had to, but I had to learn how to work on plasterer stilts, you see, because they built a costume on these stilts, and the character was 10 feet tall. It was a huge hit. And so I stayed around Atlanta for a long time, doing shows, did a lot of plays, did a lot of commercials, did some films. And uh, then I went to the right audition one day. I, th I think... Uh, Don pointed out that uh, I'd been in a, I'd done a lot of movies. I was in Smokey and the Bandit. I don't know if people seen that thing 20 times, didn't know I was in it. <laughs> the beginning of the movie, you know, Paul Williams, a little guy, a songwriter, and Pat McCormick is a huge guy. They come walking up, this fellow's talking to the girl, and they say to me, hey, Hoss, you tell me where I can find the Bandit? And I go, I ain't seen him. So, Three words, which were really one word in Southern, right? So, <laughs> Y'all laugh, but I still get a little check for that every now and then. <laughs> Over the years, it's added up. I would say, you know, it's come to about mm, three, four thousand dollars a word now. <laughs> uh, but I'd also done a film called The Moon Runners, which was a low budget independent film. A friend of mine named Guy Waldron, who directed at the WSB television there in Atlanta. He was a writer from Kentucky and he run into this old moonshiner from North Carolina named Jerry Rushing, who was a great storyteller and he put those stories together and did this film called The Moon Runners. And I had a small part in that. I played a Yankee revenuer who uh, arrested the mule who ran the sugar up to the still. <laughs> you had to have been there. <laughs> but, uh, so the movie was okay actually. Uh, Robert Mitchum had done the first great moonshine movie called Thunder Road, 1957. Let me tell the story, I can tell it all. He wrote that song too, Robert Mitchum did. And we all, I remember seeing that at the drive-in and we were just standing on it coming out of there. <laughs> uh, so old, uh, his son, Jim Mitchum, played Robert Mitchum's brother in Thunder Road, but he comes back to play one of the Duke boys. Arthur Honeycutt and other actors, but the great thing that the Moonrunners had going for it was that Waylon Jennings was doing the music. Waylon, great story. If y'all know, don't know who he is, you should. He, he was from West Texas, and his best friend was Buddy Holly. And uh, Buddy Holly was just a genius. And uh, he was on tour with Buddy and gave up his seat on the plane to the Big Bopper. And uh, the, the, then they'd take the old bus overnight. It was cold and everybody was tired. And they get there the next day and Buddy's plane has crashed. And Waylon never got over that, really. He was the best friend. They were the same age. And then Waylon went on to have a long career doing a lot of stuff. But anyhow, this little Moonrunners thing, you know, guy went out to L.A. and he was working for Norman Lear, I think. I said, that's weird. But uh, what happened was, now remember this, it's the late 70s. Everybody loved the South. We were good. We were all right. You know, NASCAR was just try to taking off. You had Dale Earnhardt and K.O. Yarborough and 
an awesome bill from Dawsonville, and it became a national Sunday afternoon. It's NASCAR, and uh, it was just hotter than a two-dollar pistol. And Waylon and Willie now are the outlaw music. They're really hot and country music and Dolly Parton, all that's going strong. And um, Smokey and the Bandit comes out and, ain't seen him, the biggest box office hit ever. I mean, it was just so in Hollywood, you know how they think. Now, also, the President of the United States was a peanut farmer from Plains, Georgia. So <laughs> that, that things, it was about the South. So these Hollywood guys have said, we got to do something Southern. we got to do something Southern. And guys in the right place at the right time, they plopped this thing down. Dukes of Hazard. So I was the first person cast as Cooter, remember the turtle, um, the mechanic. And uh, so I go to the first read-through. And Waylon's doing the music for this. And uh, I just loved his music. There's Denver Pyle, if y'all remember him, Mr. Darlin from the Andy Griffith show, and also the Mad Jack on that series. He was in, played the, on that show uh, the, with the bear. And uh, he did, but he probably done three or 400 movies. I know he had uh, Westerns, Death Valley Days. Great, he was the Texas Ranger in Bonnie and Clyde that tracked him down, uh, Frank Hamer. Uh, but uh, there's old Denver. And there is uh, Sorrel Book, who playing Boss Hogg, shows up, and we're sitting at the, around the pool at the Holiday Inn Motel in Conyers, Georgia. And there's Sorrel Book, who's this kind of quiet little Jewish fellow from New York, who was, uh, spoke 12 languages, and uh, he uh, was an opera singer and a Shakespearean actor and a Broadway star and one of the funniest physical comics ever. Boss Hogg, now. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. It was rumored that Boss Hogg worked for the CIA. <laughs> and he had, when he had been in the Korean War as a as a translator and stuff, but he also, you know, was just an absolute genius, a brilliant guy. Uh, he worked in, you know, in military intelligence. And uh, so I'm thinking CIA. I'd heard that, and I never asked him. You know, he wouldn't have told me anyway. But he was one of those guys in New York Times Sunday crossword <laughs> like that. And he did speak six or seven languages very fluently, including uh, Mandarin Chinese. And, and we all sitting around one day, and these Chinese folks came up, and I can't do Chinese, but Sorrel goes off, hot, 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 and we're thinking, he's making fun of those folks. He ought not to be. He was carrying on a conversation in their language, and they were amazed at Boss Hawk in his costume, you know. <laughs> so, and then, you know, there's the Duke boys, these good looking guys, they're real talented. And uh, James Best, who was a wonderful actor uh, and one of the few Southerners in the cast, uh, James uh, had a great career. Uh, and there was a movie, The Left-Handed Gun, with Paul Newman, uh, in which, uh, let's say, how did it work out? Uh, Pat Garrett, no, Jimmy shot Denver. Denver was a deputy and uh, they were escaping and then, I forget who it was that shot Jimmy, I think it was, uh, uh, John Daner, who played Pat Garrett. But anyhow, they both ended up dead in that one. Uh, Jimmy, a great actor, funny. And, and we start getting these old guys, and we're just having fun. What's not to have fun with? So it's got this car, 69 Dodge Charger RT, with a 440 under the hood, and this thing flies. And it really was. We just throw the stunt guys in there, hit that ramp about 60 miles an hour, and it will go through the air. You got the roll bars and the cages and all that stuff, but everybody, it doesn't matter. They're stunt guys, you know. They're crazy, and uh, they they love doing that stuff. Uh, so here we got this crazy show. Waylon's doing the music, like I said, and it does the theme song. Just do good old boys. But then Catherine Bach shows up at the swimming pool there, <laughs> and uh, it kind of got quiet. <laughs> all you could hear was the sound of jaws dropping. Like, and that you just, besides being, uh, having the best legs in the history of legs, <laughs> she is it was one of those, you know, just magical people who uh, is still our friend very closely. So uh, we, we all uh, have became sort of a family. This is in the fall of 1978, y'all. That's 40 years ago. And... Uh, as uh, Don pointed out, the show came on the air January 23rd of 79, and um, 
the uh, Howard Rosenberg, who's a, cr a critic for the, and still is for the Los Angeles Times, said this show will not last past the first commercial break. <laughs> Forty years ago, y'all. Now, in those days, remember, there was no cable, no cable TV. There was no satellite dishes. There was no internet. What you, you, you didn't, I mean, what you had was three networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS. You had public television and independent stations. So, on Friday nights, I'm not making this up, nowadays a hit show has 12, 14 million people, big deal. On Friday nights, 40 million Americans would tune in to watch the Dukes and send the kids to bed and watch Dallas. And, and this went on for years. While it was on the air, they started syndicating so the kids could get home in the afternoon, watch it on TV. Meanwhile, they're starting to show it all over the world. Different countries, different languages we're getting into. Then they start coming out with merchandise. Um, there were over 1,000 different items of merchandise that were made by the Dukes of Hazard, by you know, Dukes of Hazard on it. Now, on top of the General Lee, the most popular car in the world, by all, serious surveys have shown this, is a Confederate battle flag the St. Andrew's Cross, which Yankees say, is that the Statue of Stars and Bars there? Which it's not, but you, you, try, you try to explain these things and you know, you're wasting your time, really. No, no, you see, this is the Christian cross of St. Andrew who was, you know, he was, he was, he was uh, crucified, spread eagle like that's what, that's the X, that's the cross. And I said, it's been used in many cultures all over the world. And, uh, so, but it was the Confederate battle flag and previously the Confederate naval jack in the square version. And they go, oh, that's very interesting. Well, we did that show, and like I say, and, and the, one of the biggest demographics was black folks in the South. I mean, just love that show. I mean, everybody watching. I mean, you've got 40, 50 million people watching every week. That's, you know, a lot of people. And I'm living, my office was in the King District in Atlanta because uh, I commuted to L.A., and I'm down there on the corner, Cuda, come on, man, where Boss Hog? And all that stuff, we're just getting it. They love the show. And uh, never had a complaint at all. Used to drive that generally in parades in Atlanta. Until much later. So that show went on for seven years, but it really has kept on going on. I just wanted y'all to know that we're on the case. Miss Helma gave me this today. We have three stores, Dukes of Hazard Museums. That's what I did when I got redistricted out of Congress. <laughs> I, went, I went out and I did some good moves. I was in primary colors, you know, with Emma Thompson and John Travolta and all that. And um, I was in a movie with, uh, with a great actor, the British actor, I'm, what's, that I love. I'm losing my mind. Anthony Hopkins, yeah, one of my heroes. I did a film with him called Meet Joe Black. Did a lot of stuff. But I'm in L.A. and I hate L.A. And I, and I was in New York and doing all this stuff. So I said, I'm coming back home. And I'm going to go up, find a, we had a place in D.C. And I said, well, she's working in New York. She's a big muckety-muck. And I said, well, I'm going to find me a place out in the country, maybe in the mountains, and just do some writing and I'll get an agent up in New York. And I'll go up there. Well, I've been out there a couple of weeks when I see this old kind of a food stand, a fruit stand, a country, you know, where you get souvenirs and things, just a roadside thing. And I thought, you know, this is road that leads up to the Skyline Drive, two-lane highway, and I'm thinking, I could get me an old General Lee. Now, this is 15 years after the show ended almost. I could get me an old General Lee and set it out front there, get the costumes out, and get all that you know, scripts and the pictures from the show, and maybe make some T-shirts and sell some Uncle Jesse's apple cider and and, uh, and call it cooters. And Alma goes, "Well, you go right ahead, but that's about the dumbest idea I've ever heard." Of. <laughs> I have things to do, places to go, things to do. I'm very well. If, uh, so I did that, and uh, didn't put much into it, and got this old General Lee for three thousand bucks. And we had a grand opening. Now, Alma is a brilliant press relations and public relations and worked for the Schuberts and did all this stuff. So she knows how this stuff does. 
on opening day at this little place in a, a town of, my, the county's only got a few thousand people in it, 5,000 people showed up at Hooters. Oh man, this is great! You know, right? So I started doing music and it kept on for five years. Now we have three, three venues, one in Nashville, one in Gatlinburg, and, and one in uh, Luray, which is huge. And we do live music in there every week, play bluegrass and all that. But this was from the, was this from the Nashville store today? Okay, today, you worried about them taking down our flags? We sold 26 rebel flags. We sold t-shirts, but all these have the, the flag on them. T-shirts, ball caps, uh, pictures, license plates, shot glasses, yo-yos, beach towels, rings, purses, <laughs> necklaces, bandanas, wallets, coffee cups and mugs, bottle openers. I can't even read that. Oh, Dixie horns, a little horn. I just press it, you know, and amazing. Cigarette lighters, does anybody still smoke? Uh, guitar picks, keychains, magnets, uh, cars, the model cars, knives, a little knife, serious knives, a little knife, kids knife, hot sauce, bumper stickers. I don't know, this is, so the words get, this show, still shown all over the world in all these languages, I can't begin it. We did a gig in, uh, we did a Duke's Fest, we called it, in Nashville in 2006 and it was the this is now what that's 20 years after the show's ended over 20 years after the show's ended there were according to the Nashville paper uh, 80 to 100 thousand people there wow. had a whole cast uh, we did music we had a couple hundred general leaves that people built and rolled in as flags everywhere and as you talk about real and um, we jumped to General Lee this is a big car, 272 feet. That's almost a football field. I'm not making that up. So that's, that's just kind of fun we have, you know? And that's a serious, wonderful part of Southern culture. And now, and nobody's, nobody in all this time has said a word about flags or said a word about monuments. What is this, I'm thinking? Where did this come from? But anyhow, the, the, the Dukes of Hazzard is doing fine. We did another show this past July, smaller scale, 25, 30,000 people. There were people, got people showing up from New Zealand. Yeah, crikey, mate, I got a General Lee back home. They just, what? <laughs> <laughs> they do, they build these. I mean, they're in France, they're in Spain, they're in Germany, all over the world people are showing up. There's one on the island of uh, Malta. There's a General Lee this guy has, he was there. So it's become this thing that people relate to as something about the spirit of rebellion. The re we're rebels. See, we just say we're rebels. It's not Southern. You don't have to get into all that. We're just rebels. And everybody identifies with that. European governments that are trying to break away are flying Confederate battle flags as a symbol. And of course, that flag's been flown all over the world in all of our wars that we fought. Amen. Uh, so that's the good news. And for us, you know, unabashed, unapologetic, and this, this is the good part, the really good part. When the flag thing started, and people started hauling them down, and we really, all that going on, um, I put out, I just woke up one morning, because that's what we do, you know, we, and it's all in the spirit of fun, and it's black people and red people and yellow people, and who cares, you know, old people, young people all over the world. Uh, we just don't care. Now, I put out a little pamphlet that talks about how this works. It's called People. It's called, hey, how y'all doing? Fine, come on in. <laughs> just if you treat everybody nice and, and treat everybody the same, your problem solved. You got a problem with the flag? I'm sorry, that's too bad. You might want to run somewhere else because we got 23,000 of them here. <laughs> and the rest of us like it. <laughs> so you might want to rethink your position. Uh, I talked about those bridges we built and the natural bridges that Southerners have, but it's being corrupted now. It's nothing to do with the culture. It's entirely political. And politics, of course, is about dividing people up, binary situation, good guys, bad guys. We're right, you're wrong. We're, we're good, you're bad. And then pouring enormous amounts of money behind it with these public relations campaigns with people like was mentioned today, Jeff Bezos and George Soros, put hundreds of millions of dollars into demonizing us 
into vilifying us for doing exactly what we've done all our lives. We're Southerners. They're a people. They're a family. It's their flesh and blood. You know, we put flowers on their graves. We got their pictures on our wall. Their names are in our Bibles. You bad mouthing my family? Yes, they are. And they're bad mouthing us, too. And I don't think we need to apologize. I understand it, particularly for kids who are confused. You know, I get so much pressure. We're outnumbered, y'all. As I said last night, it's like Dizzy Dean said about the baseball game. He sees these kids playing baseball on a sandlot. And uh, goes over and says, little right fielder over there, little boy, scrawny boy, barefoot, got old torn up. Gene says, son, what's the score there? Little right fielder says, well, sir, them boys is whooping us uh, 79 to nothing. <laughs> but we ain't had our bat yet. <laughs> It's kind of where we are right here with this thing. I don't know how you fight it, and that's what we talk about here. And we do the best we can. And I think in the next few years we'll see that there's a way. It's through the media, of course. Maybe we can get a cable TV show on RFD or something. If we do, the word will get out and people will watch it. And we start getting out a positive message everywhere. And I think particularly through rural churches that are black and white can join together and talk about these things. Not hateful people. Yeah, we got, you know, there's bigots and hateful people in every race and every society around the world. There's no doubt about that. I don't know if, if uh, Kirk is still here, but I read a thing where it said, where, where somebody said, were you, he was, uh, called you a bigot and racist. You, you were involved in one of those groups and some of them are, they're racist. And he said, yeah, I reckon some of them are racist. That's not unusual. Some of your people are racist too, you know? I mean, racism is, you know? It just is. And we can't be apologetic about that. Uh, that yeah, they are. We don't like them. They don't represent us. They don't represent the good Christian spirit that most of us have. And we don't like them. And they show up, you know, or just a perfect example is this nut comes into a beautiful church in Charleston, kills people. I think it was almost like the media was delighted when they found that picture of him with a Confederate battle flag. They could have found pictures of him with, a, with an American flag, probably. They could have found a picture of him with, I don't know, anything. But, yeah. Well, now, so this, we gotta deal with that. This one, now, there's 330 million people in America, and here's one of them who's, you know, that homicidally insane and crazed, poor victim of drugs or something. And we're supposed to take all, every, all of our beliefs away, just turn our back on our families, take our flags, our symbols down, and all the joy that's meant to us. Because, why? It makes no sense. Here's what I've written. But these bridges are being weakened daily, the bridges we built, by massive, unbridled political hysteria of cultural cleansing and political correctness and sociological jargon that has particularly infected our nation's power elite. From Hollywood to our largest and most powerful newspapers and of course throughout academia, where the current mania is the application of current ideologies to complex historical events. This practice of presentism judging past societies and events by current political uh, wisdom, raises the question of whether or not many university departments have become homes for the helpless, the deluded, and the deranged. As H.L. Mencken once remarked, there's no theory so absurd, absurd that it won't be believed by a college professor. <laughs> Present company accepted, of course. Yet, yeah, this is our new reality, a playing field that is upside down and backwards, where the rules of common sense and compromise have been thrown out by the new powers that be. These new rules have completely overwhelmed the mass media, the major television networks and their cable subsidiaries, and with them have gone the largest publishing houses, corporate boardrooms, all of one major political party and much of the other. 
But the voice of half of America, at least, is not being heard on this issue. For the polls show that a majority of Americans oppose this cultural cleansing of the South. Those of us who honor our Southern ancestors and who sense the greatness of our heritage are appalled at the destructive vitriol, the unhinged demagoguery, and unparalleled sanctimony of these quote unquote social justice warriors who have no comprehension of social justice or how to achieve it. Yet they have us surrounded and they control the resources, the message, and the good old cold cash. We have tried calm reason, but we all know that it is practically impossible to reason someone out of a position which they didn't use reason to get into. For many years now, the Sons of Confederate Veterans and other groups have decried the use of Southern symbols by racist and radical white power type organizations. And I think I said this before. I might point out here at the Southern Poverty Law Center, a group which is insanely bent on destroying every positive thought of the Confederacy, has spent tens of millions of dollars tracking and infiltrating these white racist groups and can only find an estimated 35,000 or so of these people in the whole nation, most of them up north, by the way. Compare that to the 75 to 80 million Americans who are descended from those of us who fought for the Confederacy. Yes, that's about one out of every four Americans. The KKK and other radical bigots desecrate our symbols and malign our brave ancestors with their neo-Nazi idiocy, but have nothing, zero, nada, to do with our heritage. Yet when they appear, they are followed by every major quote-unquote news outlet, for that sells tickets and ratings and advertising. No one has suffered more from the, their heartlessness of this these racist maniacs and the good people of Charleston who were murdered by the sad, sick, and deluded Dylan Roof. What we're losing in this flood, flood tide, is any semblance of truth, reason, understanding, and brotherhood. Lost also is the fact that symbols mean very different things to different people in different contexts. You see the happy kids playing with the Dukes of Hazard, and then you've got these people. I mean, people know, we know, we can tell. But to, uh, to the left, to the cultural cleansers, there can be but one definition, but one interpretation, and that's theirs. And if you disagree with it, bigot, racist, slave traitors, you gotta be ashamed of your ancestors. Second reconstruction of the South is now underway. And we have quickly discovered that our friends are being quiet and our enemies are being very loud. The reconstructionists of every ilk are now busy trying to impose a political solution to a cultural problem that has never worked before and it will not work in the future. You know how here in the world, in the culture, everyone seems to get along just fine. No one I know wishes anyone of color any harm and we all hope that everyone is treated equally by all just as the good Lord taught us. But in the world of politics, everyone is at each other's throats because that's how the world of politics works. In the current crisis, there's no answer to the charges of victimization because they're almost entirely hypothetical. Based upon canards and driven by hyperventilating screeds about some justice that is being systematically withheld. I mean, in a cult of victimization, no one can cop to having victimized themselves, now can they? So there's just rage in the generalized name of resistance. <clears throat> Better not read that. <laughs> <laughs> so I've talked now to political independent, uh, the, the, the party of Jefferson and Jackson, the People's Party doesn't like people like me. I don't think, you know, people just drive trucks and you know, raise kids and try to do right. And, you know, just regular old people. So I'm gonna dedicate what future is left to me to our common fight for truth about our past and respect in the present. You see, this cult of cultural cleansing is attacking our heart and soul. And when they attack our honest history and heritage, 
they are attacking our families. And if we don't fight back with every fiber of our being, we will lose this fight. Yes, they attack our families. For me and my family, it starts with Annie Jean Jacobs, one of my great-great-grandmothers. Annie Jean was born around 1839, Columbus County, North Carolina. She married Harley Jenrette. So he served with the Waccamaw Rifles. Now, Annie Jean's younger brother, Gabriel Jacobs, was born in 1841. He was killed at Fraser's Farm on the last day of the Seven Days Campaign. Now, Annie Jean and Gabriel, they had a great-great-grandfather who was also named Gabriel Jacobs. He lived in Northampton County, Virginia. It's on the eastern shore around the time of Debbie Devon, the great laughing king of the Accomac Indians. Now this Gabriel was married to an Indian named Bab. And in 1690, that first Gabriel Jacobs, an African slave, was granted his freedom by his owner, John Custis. 20 years later, 20 years later Gabriel's son Primus sailed to Wilmington, North Carolina, and he soon became the patriarch of a, an extraordinary triracial isolate. I think y'all know what those are. So, 170 years after Gabriel Jacobs became a free man, his namesake, Gabriel Jacobs, died trying to stop McClellan's retreat to the James River. Now, this, these truths are things that I've just come to know in the last few years. Because the South, it's a land of stories and secrets and mysteries. But above all, these stories are about families, black and white and red, and of their struggles through good times and bad times. Our Southern people have persevered through far worse than the battle we are now engaged in. By the way, we fighting Southerners are the reason the United States is here. Yep. To here's to South Carolina. The American Revolution was won in the South, in places like Kings Mountain, Guilford Courthouse, and above all, at Cowpens, where men like Daniel Morgan and Light Horse Harry Lee, Robert E. Lee's father, and William Washington, George Washington's cousin, Southerners all, drove Bannis Tarleton and the beleaguered Cornwallis north into Virginia and the trap at Yorktown. Our families have fought and died in all of our nation's conflicts. From the South came men like Alvin York, Sergeant York from Tennessee, Audie Murphy from Texas, and as was mentioned earlier, the 19 boys from Little Bedford, Virginia, who gave their lives on Omaha Beach, 1944. And all of those fathers and grandfathers and uncles and brothers and cousins who were the first to answer when their country called. Their pictures on our walls, their names in our Bibles, their memories in our hearts, and on their graves we place remembrance. And that is the essential nerve that these unthinking radicals have attacked. Do these political terrorists really think that we are going to turn our backs on our flesh and blood who came before us? What kind of people do they think we are? What kind of spineless people do these radical social warriors think we are? We Southerners were born standing up and talking back. And unlike folks from other places, we take our birthright seriously. We will have it out with the apostles of hate and we will stop this attack upon our families and upon the truth. Now, I don't think anybody has a corner on the truth, and although often I may not know what the truth is, I always know what it isn't. But it appears to be clear that this current hysteria is aimed far more than just at our different view of past events. Indeed, it may be about how a view held by half a nation can simply be scoffed at, derided, and made false by a campaign of historical revisionism that is conducted by the other half, the half who control education and the media. And George Orwell may have been a cranky old leftist, but his dark vision of mind control was deadly accurate. So if you don't like Animal Farm or 1984, we will find ourselves using the adjective Orwellian with greater and greater frequency. What kind of America is it? where good citizens who pay taxes, support good causes, fight in wars, work hard, raise their children right, are suddenly the oppressive enemy. 
You know, those deplorables who drive trucks and plow fields and own small businesses and work in law enforcement and join the army and teach school and work in factories? We are public enemy number one to the northeastern and coastal media elites. They wish to totally eradicate any scrap of our honest feelings and our deep beliefs. And they're doing it, y'all. This is what we are experiencing right now. And that's why we're here tonight. So let us arm ourselves with historical truths. Let, let us give all we have to the cause of freedom of speech and freedom of thought and freedom of expression. And let us stand against these radical social justice thugs just as we have always stood against any tyranny over the man, mind of mankind. And most importantly, let us teach our children well. Thanks, y'all. Hey.